Hey everyone, thanks again for joining us uh, for Sundays in Song. We're featuring composer Jared Tate and his work Found Again. Uh, we'll be featuring this on our next Even Song in October. Jared, thank you so much for making time and speaking with us today. It's it's a pleasure. Um, I'd like to introduce myself in my language, if that's okay. Uh, I, I would. I would. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay, please uh, go ahead. hatak sohol chifoit Jared impichichaha tape chikashasaya. Hello, everyone. My name is Jared Impichichaha Tate. Um, I'm a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation here in Oklahoma, and I'm a professional classical composer, and I live here in Oklahoma City. So, Thank you so much. And uh, language is one of the things that I'm particularly interested in talking to you about um, because uh, there is such a richness of language that uh, that Joy Harjo brings to the text that you set, um, some uh, some in English, but uh, but also some not. And I'm uh, I'm wondering if you can uh, talk a little bit about uh, what it's what it's like not just to set uh, Joy Harjo's poetry, which of course is is wonderful but also um, what it's like to set in English versus, um, uh, versus for instance, Muscogee Creek, which she uses in, uh, in, some, in, in some of the texts. And if that, and just what that experience is like for you as, as a composer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. And, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's a question that comes up quite often. And, you know, it's actually, it's actually quite simple, which is, it's, it's beautifully simple because um, in fine art, in classical music and fine art, um, we deal with multiple ethnicities from all over the world throughout the history of fine art. And so that's already very, very present. And so, I mean, like, so if I take myself back as, as growing up with piano literature, I'm playing literature from people who identify ethnically from, from their national identities, you know, from history. So, Debussy is extremely French, Prokofiev is extremely Russian, Toro Takamitsu is extremely Japanese, and so Scarlatti, Italian, you know, it's just all these people, and they, they had ethnic, you know, conversations about each other and opinions and stuff like that, and so this, this whole idea of ethnicity and language has been present in um, Western fine art for quite some time in a really wonderful way. It creates a lot of conversation, sometimes differing opinions, you know, those challenging opinions, but also uh, there's a, a great camaraderie historically that we're contributing our ethnicities to the genre. So I am literally just doing what's been done for a couple of thousand years already. So that part is actually quite natural and quite simple. And when it comes to singers, you think about this, the singer's world is a world of language and phonetics constantly. And there's, that's why there's an international phonetics, you know, uh, there's the IPA that, that, that's, that, that's their guide for pronouncing any possible language in the world. And the IPA works for everything, which is great. So anyway, so what I'm doing is I'm adding another chapter uh, very, and a, very joyously, I love this, of, of adding our American Indian languages or North American Indian languages to the repertoire and singers eat it like breakfast. It's just wonderful. And, and to be quite honest, there's nothing really mysterious about it. It's just a new set of phonetics that they're adding to their repertoire of singing. So, and then now I can say this a, kind of in a biased way, but our native languages here from North America sound beautiful, son. But you know, I don't know language that doesn't sound beautiful sung. It's it's the human voice and we're and we're creating vowels that have texture and color and their own aesthetics. And every language has its own kind of ethos and aesthetic to it. But every language is really, really beautiful. And of course, there, you, you can see, see that demonstrated or hear it demonstrated in different songs in which sometimes the person just captures their own language so beautifully within their own songs. So, you know, composers and librettists are, are very aware of how it's delivered, that kind of thing. So I'm able to explore this, this world within the language and phonetics and colors and beauty of native languages from this, from this hemisphere. It's, it's really, really a beautiful journey. It, uh, I, I so enjoyed being able to experience this last year when Words and Music uh, performed this live, and uh, and to be able to hear uh, to hear those those words set, it was it was very very uh, meaningful and as you say beautiful. The human voice brings to life all sorts of different aspects 
um, of of language and lets it lets it shine in its own way. And so I'm uh, I, I'm I'm so pleased that words and music was able to uh, to bring uh, these words and your music to life. Um, oh, I, I totally agree. To yeah, and you know, in this in this work, one thing that's really nice is that we have two languages next to each other. So there's a little bit of comparison to the singers, and I like that. I think it's 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 really really nice to hear that that comparison. Um, so yeah, yeah, this is it's, this was a really cool project, and I, and you know, um, uh, Joy had created her own hymn. Uh, her own Creek hymn that she had written. And then also I used another hymn that was in the actual Creek repertoire. So just, I just, there's so many wonderful aesthetic aspects covered with this project. It was really cool to do. That's it's, it's so wonderful. And as, as I mentioned, uh, of course, Joy's poetry is, uh, is, is powerful and uh, powerful and deep and also humorous at times. And, you know, it, it really, it really spans a wide gamut of 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 emotion. Um, what I, I was uh, different composers have different ways that they first begin to work with a text. What um, what were what are some of the natural ways that, that you begin working with with texts? Do you um, analyze them at first? Is it instinctive? Is it? I know I, I I myself find myself sometimes going back and forth between sort of a left brain and right brain kind of uh, kind of view with it. Yeah, I you know the answer is kind of all of the above. It's I think artistically it's always a grab bag, but that bag is full of experience, really. And you know even as a young composer or young artist has their experience, and an older one has and certain experience, experiences that have either evolved or changed, that kind of thing. And so there there are different types of experiences that we bring to any kind of a creative process. And some of those are more formally trained experiences, you know. So like I know how to write music on the page, so that's a really important part that I can notate. And it's it's very similar to anybody who works in words like poetry. So like for instance. A poet brings the experience of knowing the language and being able to write it down with letters and words. Most poets, that, and some some poets are more oral. Um, but the thing is that we bring in we bring in some type of a mastery of what we're manipulating. So I can either speak the language and I or I can write it down that kind of thing. But I know the language. So then, then I believe that what we all do naturally, since we're, we're equipped with some basic skill and technique to what we're working with. What we start, what we do as human beings very naturally is we begin to abstract. So we take our own knowledge and we literally break it apart and deconstruct it and reassemble it in, in a way that's not necessarily the easiest way to define because every person has their own process of reconstructing that. But that's, but that in and of itself is human abstraction. We are abstracting and recreating a new little universe within ourselves. And so that process is just, <laughs> it's cool. So it makes us human, you know, yeah. um, cats yeah. can't quite do that. They can give us neat snuggles and purrs and everything like that, but they can, they don't, uh, they don't uh, abstract in the same way as the humans do. So, but that's what makes us uniquely human and beautiful on the inside. And it's, it's, and that's why that journey will never, ever stop. We'll never have, there's, there's an infinite amount of art that will be created as long as humans exist. So anyway, that's, so it is a grab bag of those experiences and, and techniques. And we, and we take one and we start to deconstruct it and reconstruct it based on an inspiration that we have. And that inspiration come from many different things. It can come from our environment. It can come from a conversation. It can come from a feeling, uh, an, an experience that's hard to explain necessarily, or just, I don't know, just any, any type of a, uh, interaction that we have with, with our lives is going to create some type of an uh, inspiration. Um, you know, I have a six-year-old son, so I am emotionally very inspired by my interactions with him in ways that I didn't when I was 20, you know, so he's added a dimension to my life that I draw on constantly, which makes sense. And the same thing is I've got different friends, and but a lot of my relationships inspire my feelings that I want to put to music. And so that's like an example. So now in this case, you're asking about, you know, the poetry. Well, somebody has already done that to a degree in their poetry. And now as a musician, I'm taking their abstracted thing and I'm reacting to that. And so I'm bringing in my skill set of music technique that I have 
and being responsive to words. And, and so it's just another, another layer that's really, really cool. And then you have super abstraction that's going on. So now I, I will say this, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and tangent on, on, on Joy in particular. I've, I've known her poetry for 30 years and I, I actually wrote a piece that involved her poetry for the first time back in 1997. And I was instructed to do so by Jean Quictacy, who's a visual artist. And she said, you've got to read Joy's poetry. And, and, and she wanted me to incorporate and I, it was beautiful. It was a beautiful instruction. And so um, I was able to secure permission from Joy to use that then. And then for this, we, we secured permission as well. And then she actually came and appeared at the premiere and read even more of her poetry as interludes. I mean, it was just unbelievable. But I will say this very clearly, that Joy's poetry to me is incredibly evocative. And when I say evocative, I mean, it brings out a huge gamut of emotions. I am evoked to feel and think in, in all kinds of ways that are so uh, uh, inspiring musically. I mean, her poetry to me translates to music very readily. And so, I, just, I mean, these poems, I, I was just going through poems and going, oh, it's like this, it's an endless volume. So I, I had to, you know, weed it down and select. And I just allowed myself to go, okay, I'd like a balance of poems of covering different emotions in the piece. It was one thing I wanted. And I just was reading through and reading through and just kind of, after a while, just kind of pairs down. And then I kind of had four, four poems that I wanted to, to treat in this, in this work. And then when we did add, we added stuff to, to the interludes um, and so that was kind of filled it out, but, but um, I was just able to just kind of brainstorm and just live with it and read through and feel and just kind of let it kind of fall through filters into a balance of, of what, what I had composed. But I mean, like I said, her, her poetry is extremely evo emotionally evocative of all kinds of feelings. So for me, it's a, a real treat to, to write to her, to her words. Absolutely. And I, I love, I love the idea that you're talking about layers of abs abstraction the poet brings one layer of abstracting their experience. The composer brings another layer of abstracting that filtered through their experience. And even the audience brings another layer in interpreting that and, and, and taking it in. And it, you know, it very much resonates, you know, with the idea of this work and the title of this work, the idea of finding again, that we are, you know, this, this process of, 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 of reinterpretation um, is, you know, it's sort of echoed, echoed in that. Um, I agree. Uh, I, I appreciate that because yeah, that's those two words found again really resonated with me because we're we are always rediscovering ourselves and artists are constant. That's what we do professionally. Our, we are in the business of feelings, you know, and so we're always rediscovering our feelings. And so found again just seemed to be a very apt couple of words for for this. Yeah. Work. Um, is there uh, anything else that you you'd want to share for um, uh, for a first time listener of this piece that uh, that uh, you'd want them to go in? thinking about or listening for um, as they as they experience this. Yes, um, and in fact, um, the, the, I, we talk about the, the hymns, the Creek hymns. Um, there's a history to that that I think is really, really beautiful and wonderful that you know most people aren't aware of because you know uh, there's so much you, American history that's it's crazy. We're always learning about each other's history over and over again. It's incredible. But the history of the hymn in Indian country is, is very unique and very, very special. Okay, so the hymn is a product of missionaries coming and bringing the Christian religion to many tribes. And the Christian religion is very, very present in Indian country um, and has different histories depending on the tribe that you go to. But uh, often um, our tribe, our, uh, Bibles were translated into our tribal languages. We have printed Bibles in our own languages. And so as a result, we have what's commonly referred to as Indian church. And so where Indian communities will go to church and they have a, they have a, a Christian a service that's, that's conducted in the language. So you've got the language that's actually read. But then, of course, you can imagine the, the Protestant style hymns that came into the church were then re mimicked. I mean, so we, we took those in and we actually appropriated that style and created our own style. So there's an entire repertoire within many different tribes of our original hymns mm -hmm. that we added to the text. And so it's a lot of it's Christian text. Some of it is straight out of the Bible. Some of it is new. Um, and so, but these melodies 
um, kind of, they have their own uh, variations of some sound very Protestant white, but some sound very much like our own tribal style and some are kind of in between, but there's a whole, there's a repertoire that has this kind of hybrid uh, or, or, you know, uh, just many different styles within it. So the, there's a hymn literature and a hymn repertoire within many tribes that's uh, very weighty and very present and, and very well known and sung within tribal communities. And so um, the Creek hymns are, are an example. The Creeks have their own, their own set of hymns and Choctaws and Chickasaws sing the same hymns. Um, you've got Comanche hymns, you know, on the western side of the state, and there's a whole repertoire. And there actually, there was, a, it was just a, a gal just a few years ago, but 19 year old at the time, created, uh, did an album of all these Comanche hymns. Kiowas are very famous for their repertoire of hymns as well, and you can buy CDs of those. Um, so anyway, so the the hymn is a is a really beautiful part of our chapter, and and a, and a total brand new repertoire that came into the 17 and 1800s. And so um, I love our melodies and our hymns. I, I, I orchestrate them quite often. I, I really, really uh, have an affinity towards them. My father sang them as a kid. Um, I just, you know, I, I love them. I, I know our hymns. And um, so anyway, that's the, there's a whole repertoire of hymns from the southeastern United States of Creeks, Cherokees, Choctaws, and Chickasaws, and Seminoles. And so I like, I kind of gravitate towards those in a lot of my orchestrations. And so I did the same thing here. Um, and Joy had happened to compose her own her own um, lyrics for a hymn that, that that was the the beautiful baby beautiful child mm -hmm. movement and that just I mean I, I still get really teared up when I think about it and I get goosebumps when I think about that but that that movement in particular actually is very special to me that was where I was really having my heart on on my sleeve sure. in that particular sure. movement. Sure, I, it's um, uh, I, I can I can only I, I can only imagine the. Um, the layers of meaning that are uh, are conglomerated there. I re um, I recently wrote a piece uh, based on some of my experiences of my uh, of being around my one year old daughter, and and you know and that's very meaningful. And to have layered on top of that um, uh, hymns uh, in a style that are um, so part of a tradition that you grew up with. Um, to have to have all that that sort of melange of of meaning um, wrapped into one uh, must be uh, very potent along with along with joy's words you know those things coming together I can imagine and, and I, I remember that movement as being particularly impactful so um, so I certainly experienced a fret you know at my abstraction of of, of your uh, of, of your um, uh, of your composition there so, I, so. I appreciate that. And then in 2015, my son was just two years old or just, he was a year and a half when, when I composed it. So that was, <laughs> we, were, we were in the very same, same boat. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that resonated to me very strongly. And it was just, a, you know, for me, that, that, that particular movement was a real refuge of just feeling, you know? And, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, well, this has been one, this has been wonderful to uh, to uh, hear you speak about this piece um, and everything that went into it. I think it's always illuminative to hear uh, the composer in their own words talk about their experiences of, of writing this. So thank you so much for sharing that. Is there anything that you're working on uh, right now or you're uh, is rattling around that uh, you'd be uh, willing to or any ideas that, you, that you're working on that you'd be willing to uh, share with us just briefly as we close? Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I have very blessed. I'm very grateful for the projects that I have. I just actually completed five documentaries, which is really nice. I'm going to a recording session for that here in December for, for one of them that's going to the Sundance Film Festival, which is cool. Um, and then um, also uh, I have three concertos that are being commissioned and also an opera trilogy that I'm working on and then also a musical. So there's a lot. This is next year is going to be very, very busy and very productive. Um, so I'm very fortunate, especially through a pandemic, that I've been able to stay, you know, employed and people engaging and and people are playing my music, which is really, really nice. So anyway, so I'm, I'm definitely very busy. I've got very big ideas. I mean, these are large projects and it's what I love doing. I just love creating, you know, ep <laughs> epic works about, about, you know, about American Indian history and culture. And so, so I'm just continuing the mission that I have. That's phenomenal and uh, and so wonderful that you're uh, that there are all these different avenues of expression that will be, that will bring that will allow different facets to be seen and heard about that. So yeah, excellent. Well, Jared, thank you so much for sharing your time and your thoughts with us. Uh, we so appreciate it. 
And uh, we look forward to listening to Found Again. <laughs>